All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Dream Seminar. Today, we're really pleased to have Don Tilbury, who has been a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan since 1995. Um, her research interests lie broadly in the area of control systems, uh, including applications like robotics and manufacturing systems. And since 2017, she's been the assistant director of engineering at the NSF, where she oversees a federal budget of nearly $1 billion annually. So if anyone has any questions about what it's like to uh, be in charge of the NSF, we can have some exciting discussions at the end of her talk about this. Um, but she's also been maintaining her position as well at the University of Michigan. She's published more than 200 articles in refereed journals and conference proceedings, and is a fellow of both IEEE, ASME, and is a life member of SWB. Any other things anyone wants Great, to Great, thanks. <laughs> Well, now it's Shankar's turn, or Ken's turn. A, it's a, okay, let me just jump in. So it's a special privilege for us to welcome a alumna to, uh, and Don has done a number of things. I think that in addition to all the things that Andrea said, you know, uh, Don has taught in a number of other countries. She uh, uh, she's always been a inveterate scientific traveler. I mean, in the sense of flying her trade in various places. Uh, some of you are in this class, this term, uh, 106B, 206B, where we've been talking about uh, not economic motion planning and uh, parking cars with end trailers. And in fact, when we were done, when we were thinking of uh, coming to a seminar, everybody uh, remembered uh, all their uh, <clears throat> all their steering with sinusoids and other such things. So, uh, so here, here, there will be cars, but no trailers. Cars and no trailers. So anyhow, it's a real, a real privilege. I have to say we, we all owe uh, Don a debt of gratitude for running the engineering division at the National Science Foundation. You know, the budget's grown to this uh, gaudy number of close to a billion dollars, thanks to her efforts. And uh, I think the community all owes you a big debt of gratitude. I know you're in your last year. So thank you for everything you've done for the community. And, uh, and oh, congratulations on keeping your research program going at full blast there through your uh, <coughs> stint at NSF. Over to you, Claire. Oh, I, I just, um... I'm not sure I have much to add except um, welcome Dawn and uh, it's been a pleasure throughout the time you've been at Michigan to kind of keep in touch and come and visit you um, at Michigan and see what a beautiful program you've been building there um, uh, both in um, like um, automation applied to manufacturing and a manufacturing um, center that that you guys started at Michigan but also in robotics and autonomous vehicles so thank you so much. Well, the only thing I can add is that I have always considered Don a incredible role model. And as someone who always seems to have time to answer emails promptly, be thoughtful and generous as a colleague, but at the same time, doing incredibly superb research and also doing her share in terms of work, in terms of, uh, of, of, of committee service, as, as we're mentioning. And she's also gotten this major uh, uh, coup in getting, uh, getting Toyota to support Michigan as one of its three major centers. And there's a brand new building, I believe, that's no. being built out there. And uh, I'm sure that she had a lot to do with that. So Dawn, we really appreciate you. We're really glad to see you here and we're excited to hear what you're doing next. Oh, thanks. Well, let me um, thank you for those very kind introductions. Um, it's always great to come back to Berkeley. I wish I could come back in person, but maybe next year when I'll be on sabbatical. Um, so let me um, go tell you a little bit about this uh, latest work we've been doing, which is about driver interaction with semi-automated vehicles. Um, and so <clears throat> I have, like I said, a short presentation um, that I'll go through and then I'll be happy to take some uh, questions at the end. Um, I can't see any of you, so if you have questions along the way and you want to try to catch my attention, you'll have to uh, shout out. <clears throat> so I want to um, give you this talk about a trust management framework for calibrating driver trust in semi-automated vehicles. 
And by the end of this talk, I hope you'll understand at least what those terms mean, at least in this context. The outline is pretty straightforward, so we'll jump right in. As we all know from experience, trust is an important variable that mediates human interaction. Research has also shown that it's important when humans interact with machines, including robots and other forms of autonomy. If people trust a system, they're more likely to rely on it. And as we move from robots and automation as tools to help people get things done towards teammates working together with humans, it's important to consider trust. So we define trust as the attitude that an agent will help achieve an individual's goal in a situation that's characterized by uncertainty and vulnerability. Research has considered what affects trust, how trust evolves over time, and what human behaviors reflect trust, called trusting behaviors. And we'll consider all of these factors in this work. So as I mentioned, we're going to consider the situation between humans, drivers, and automated vehicles. So AVs are robots that carry people, a special type of robot. So there's uncertainty and vulnerability when people are riding in AVs. AVs are expected to improve transportation, but only if people trust them appropriately. So what do we mean by trusting appropriately? There are two main types of miscalibration that we'd like to avoid. The first, as you can see in the picture here, is under-trusting. If the driver doesn't trust the automation to do its job, the driver may pay too much attention to driving and not enough to a secondary task. We call this disusing the automation. Now, if they were to trust it enough, they could take, use the time where the a vehicle's driving to take on other non-driving related tasks. They could watch a movie, read email, take a nap, etc. On the other hand, overtrust is also a problem. If the driver trusts the automation too much and doesn't pay enough attention to the driving task, problems can occur and serious ones like accidents. They're misusing the automation beyond its capabilities. So we want drivers to trust the automation enough so they can take advantage of it, but not too much that they over rely on the automation and end up in a dangerous situation. We want to calibrate their trust to be at an appropriate level for the situation. So let's move into the, uh, the situation here that we're gonna talk about in this presentation. So I mentioned we have driver and autonomous vehicle interaction so what we have in our lab is a simulated SAE level three automated driving system. So the vehicle can maintain speed and stay in its lane. And we assume these functions work perfectly. There's a forward collision alert system that is imperfect. It sometimes makes mistakes and we'll look at how those mistakes affect the driver's trust in the system. There's also an emergency braking system when the vehicle gets too close to an obstacle and we assume this works perfectly, so there's no crashes in the system. On the bottom right, you can see the driver gets a heads up display that the vehicle is in the automated mode. According to the definition of SAE level three, drivers must be able to take back control of the vehicle when they're requested to, or when the automation fails. Here you see a timeline of the forward collision alert system. Time is on the bottom axis, and we increment discrete time here per event, not in terms of seconds or minutes. So in the system that we, this experiment you'll see, there's about a minute between events, but not exactly the same time between every event. So the experiment starts at T0 and the events happen at times T1, T2, et cetera. Now, if there's a true alarm from the Ford collision system, <clears throat> there'll be several seconds before the obstacle would be hit. False alarms are, occur when the obstacle would have been if the alarm had been accurate. And misses are given by when the, <clears throat> there is no um, alarm, even though there is an obstacle ahead. In that case, 
If the driver doesn't take control, the emergency braking will kick in and stop the vehicle if necessary. So the notation we're gonna use here is L for true alarm, F for false alarm, and M for misses. And these are all Boolean variables, either true or false. So in the experimental setup, the driver is able to activate or deactivate the system at any time. The non-driving related search task has one Q in a field of O's, and the drivers get one point for every Q that they find correctly. They also lose points if the emergency braking kicks in because they weren't paying enough attention. So therefore, they need to focus on both the driving task and the search task. Their total compensation for participating in this experiment goes from a minimum of $15 to a maximum of $50 based on their performance in the search task minus the penalty. We designed this incentive to incentivize them to pay enough attention to both the driving and the search task. We felt for undergraduates, $35 is a pretty good um, incentive. We thought they might actually pay attention and try to maximize their reward. So after every event, a true alarm or a false alarm or a miss, we pause the simulation and ask the driver to report their change in trust. It, it, as you can see in the scale, it can be no change, slight change, or significant change, and either increase or decrease. At the end of the experiment, they fill out a survey about their trust in the system. And we use this final trust based on the survey together with the trust changes to define what we call their dynamic trust, the trust, how the trust evolves over time over this experiment. So now that we understand the experiment and what these people are doing, let's talk about how to model trust. So our goal is to calibrate trust. First, we need to model it. The standard way to measure trust in the literature is through a survey. Now this self-reporting has significant biases and it's also quite disruptive to interrupt the drivers every so often and ask them about trust. So therefore we didn't do a whole survey after every event, we just asked for their change. And we did that to give us the baseline that we could use to get initial measurements to develop these types of dynamic models. Now, existing trust models use physiological sensors, such as EEG or galvanic skin response, but they only output a trust or distrust value instead of a scaled value of trust between zero and 100, say. So in our work, we're gonna use the data that we obtained in the experiment to build a dynamic model of how trust changes over time and how trust is reflecting in the trusting behaviors that we can observe in a non-obtrusive manner. We'll then use this dynamic model to estimate trust in real time in a new set of subjects that don't have to answer these questions after every event. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with control systems. So you understand to build a model, we need inputs and outputs. So the inputs to the model are going to be these alarms and the misses from the automation system. We take these as Booleans. Now previous research has shown as you might expect, the true alarms will increase the driver's trust in automation, and both false alarms and misses will decrease their trust. The outputs are the observed trusting behaviors. These will be observed over each interval between two events. So let me tell you about these three outputs. The first is the focus. This is the percentage of time in an interval that the driver was looking at the search task instead of the road. The usage of the ADS is the percentage of time that the driver had the automation engaged instead of manually driving. And the NDRT performance, the non-driving related task or the search task performance is the total number of points that the driver gets in the search task over that time interval. Now previous work that has demonstrated that all three of these values are positively correlated with trust, meaning that as trust in the automation increases, all of these variables are expected to increase. So we take trust as the state of the system, capital T. It's measured at every discrete time or discrete event, but we can't exactly measure it. <clears throat> so the alarm conditions, the inputs will influence trust and the observed behaviors or outputs depend on trust. 
So we just use a linear systems model <clears throat> to get started that the trust at the event K plus one depends on the trust at event K plus the inputs or the alarm and the observed behaviors over the interval between events K and K plus one depend on the trust at time K. This linear model gives us some uh, simple um, things to get started. And we have random terms to represent individual variations. So I mentioned the drivers are asked about their trust change after every event and complete a trust survey at the end of the entire um, simulation. So we use those to determine their um, dynamic trust or the capital T of TK. As mentioned earlier, the Ford collision alert system was not completely reliable. <clears throat> so the, the experiment considered four different conditions for reliability. In the baseline case, the system was fully reliable. All 12 events were had true alarms. The three unreliable cases each had four mistakes out of 12 events with different mixes of false alarms and misses. So you can see we have built this trust estimator that we'll use to estimate the driver's trust in real time based on the model that we built, the linear systems model that I showed on the previous slide. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, please. Um, what is T? Uh, how do you define the vector T, capital T? Capital T is a scalar. Oh, it's, it's a scalar, okay. It's a scalar. So if you go back to this uh, thing, so T is a capital T, trust is a scalar. It's uh -huh. an, a value between, uh, we scale it. Usually the surveys have a, a Likert scale from one to seven. We mm -hmm. scale it to go between zero and a hundred. I see. So okay. based on the responses to the survey. And like I said, at the very end, we get the overall trust capital T sub T12 after uh -huh. 12 events. We'll get their total trust and then we'll um, back compute what the, the dynamic trust is after each change. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank you. And uh, how does it start out at time t, uh, t equal to t zero? So in this part, we're just building the model. So mm -hmm. we, we, we don't know the initial value when we start. When we're gonna use this for control, we start at the average value okay. from right. uh, population. Okay, got it, thank okay. you. So, um, as I mentioned, the, the, the automated driving system gives alerts to the driver. Um, and we assume that the system will know if it was a true alarm or a false alarm after it has um, given that alarm or missed it, right? Um, it, will, it will understand after the event has occurred whether it was correct or incorrect. <clears throat> Then the estimator observes the driver's behavior, their focus on the, the search task, the usage of the automated driving system and the performance on the search task, and use these observations in the model to produce an estimate of the driver's trust in real time. So in the modeling estimating, we update this after every event. And we use a Kalman filter, of course, because it's the natural thing to do to um, when you have a linear systems model. And what I've shown in the plot here is how this trust estimate changes over time. So the real observation, quote real, is in red, is taken from the driver report. Again, we start at the end and work backwards based on their incremental changes. We assume that the trust is constant over each interval between events. The black line is the best estimate from the Kalman filter and the blue shading shows the estimate confidence. On, on the event axis, you can see that the circles show a true alarm, the diamonds are false alarms, and the triangles are misses. And here's another example with a different participant, where you can see that the estimate sort of tracks the actual, but there's an offset between the two. It looks like the true and estimated trusts are converging. Perhaps 12 events is not sufficient to achieve convergence, or perhaps this subject underreports their trust since their behaviors are aligned with a higher trust level than they report. So this is the modeling and estimation piece. And now I'm gonna move into the calibration piece. 
So the overall management framework includes the estimation piece that I talked about, plus the calibration piece. So the main idea is we want to try to identify if the driver is under trusting or over trusting and then try to influence them to correct or adapt their trust level. So we assume that the automated driving system has different levels of capability in different environments. When the driving system is highly capable, such as a clear day, a straight highway, little to no traffic, the driver should have a high level of trust. However, when the ABS has a much lower capability, such as foggy or rainy day, a curvy mountain dirt road, we want the driver to have a lower trust in the system and monitor the situation more closely. So the ADS will attempt to influence the driver's trust through communication, either encouraging or discouraging the driver to pay attention to the road conditions. So this trust management framework looks sort of like a feedback block diagram that I'm sure you're all familiar with. On the far left is the trust estimator that we talked about before. The driver's on the far right and the observed driver behaviors is the same as before. The percentage of time focusing on the, on the search task, percentage of time using the drive, automated system and performance on the non-driving related tasks. For this experiment, we assume in the calibration that the forward collision system is perfect. So the driver is always warned a set distance in advance of upcoming obstacles in the road. However, the distance at which those obstacles are detected will vary based on the road condition and therefore the capability of the automated system. So we feed these variables into the trust estimator which outputs a real-time estimate of the driver's trust in the automated vehicle, and that goes into the trust calibrator. So the calibrator is kind of like a controller. It takes as inputs the estimated trust and the capability of the, of the automated vehicle. And again, we assume that the AV is self-aware. It knows its own capabilities in different environments. Then if there's a mismatch between the capability and the um, trust, there's an over trust or under trust, the trust calibrator recommends a communication style for the AV to send messages to the driver. And I'll give some examples of what those messages might be. In the under trusting case, the driver may be paying too much attention to the driving and not enough to the secondary task, thereby disusing the, the automation and the AV will send encouraging messages. In the overtrusting case, the driver is not paying enough attention to the driving and the AV will send warning messages to the driver. So after every event, the, which we treat as an obstacle in the road, the trust estimator sends a new estimate of trust to the calibrator, which is compared to the AV capability and the message is updated. Now, if those are aligned, the trust is appropriate for the um, environment and for the capability, then there's no message. So the communication style is silent. So in the experiment that we do, we have the course shown on the left. There's three different capability levels we denote as high, medium, and low. On straight paved roads in dark blue, the AV is highly capable. On dirt roads, shown in red, it has a low capability. The curvy paved roads are medium capability. Now each driver is gonna go through the course twice, once in each direction. One trial, they use the trust calibrator and the other, they use the control condition, which is no messages being sent to the driver. They just ask to drive, pay attention, find your cues, you know, see how well you can do. And Don, are they told <clears throat> about these different portions? Like, do they see that overview when they're doing the experiment? No, they just see, they just see um, what's ahead of them. Okay. So again, we assume they have perfect forward collision warning, but the, um, hang on a sec. Um, they have the forward collision warning um, is perfect. So that will, um, but it, in, the, in the high capabilities, they get a, a more look ahead to see the obstacles. So they still need to switch attention. The, I think I mentioned before that the AV cannot um, automatically uh, change lanes. It can automatically break to prevent an obstacle, but it cannot on its own change lanes. So they need to take over control to change lanes and go around an obstacle. 
And again, we have a similar incentive system, minimum $15 and bonus up to $50, depending on how well they do. So this matrix shows the four different trust states that we consider. I mean, I should say mix of trust and capability states. So on the diagonal are the calibrated states where the level of trust of the driver is appropriate to the AV capability, low, medium, or high. In this case, no messages are issued and the communication mode is silent. In the lower left corner, the trust is too low for the AV's capabilities. This is under trusting and the AV's communication is encouraging. The dark brown states are over trusting where the trust is too high for the AV's capabilities, in which case the AV will mourn the driver moderately. And finally, the red state in the upper right corner is extreme overtrusting. The AV's capabilities are low, but the trust is high. There's a harsh mourning issued to the driver. So now I'm gonna see if the video will play. If not, I have backup slides. There we go. Can you hear the... So this is the um, the silent, no appropriate um, match between trust. Hey, this is an easy road. You don't need to worry about driving. I will take care of it while you focus on finding the cues. The road is not very easy. You can still find the cues, but please pay more attention to the road. Look, I told you, I do need your attention. I can feel the road is terrible. I don't know if I can keep us totally safe. So that's the, um, I have four slides here because in case the video didn't play, but I think you guys heard the warning. So here's the statistical results of how the communication messages were able to change the driver's trust, self-reported. No, this is not self-reported. This is through the trusting behaviors because we did not ask them to fill out a survey after each event in this calibration experiment. So what the plot is showing is the change in the trust estimates using the trust model that we developed in the previous experiment um, between every interval. So each participant encountered 12 obstacles or 40 participants, so 480 events. And as I mentioned earlier, we modeled trust on a 100 point scale. So the encouraging message increased trust by about 17 points. With no message issued, trust increased by just a bit now, this is in line with previous work that shows people's trust tends to increase over time as they use a system. The warning message resulted in a slight decrease of trusting behaviors, about seven on a 100 point scale. And the harsh warning message had a much larger effect, a decrease of more than 20 points. Of course, these are human subject experiments. You can see there's quite a large spread in the data, but the differences are statistically significant. Here's a time plot of one subject going through the course. So the gray shaded areas are where the trust is calibrated. Are the, are the shaded areas, excuse me, are the different capabilities of the AV, the high capability, the medium capability, and the low capability. And you can see the points where the driver's trust is appropriate for the AV's capabilities. There's no warning issues. This particular subject started with the paved straight roads corresponding to high capability. Since their trust is lower, they receive two encouraging messages. When they're in the medium capability of the AV, the paved curvy roads, their trust is calibrated. They don't get any messages. And the final leg is on the dirt road with low capability. They receive a warning message and their trust becomes calibrated. So overall, in the trials where the calibrator was not used, meaning the control condition, the driver's trust was misaligned with the capability 70% of the time. 
When we used the trust calibrator, this miscalibration ratio was reduced to 44%. Now, given the short duration of the trials, this took, you know, order of 15 minutes per trial, and we believe that these results demonstrate the effectiveness of the trust calibration framework. And future work could consider the best messaging to use for improving this type of trust calibration. Now, none of those ratios that I told you include the time after interval right after the AV's capabilities changed, because that was an intentional change when they went to a new um, type of road, and you wouldn't expect them to be the um, subjects to be able to switch instantaneously. But we expect it would take more than one event to change their trusting behaviors. So that's what I wanted to present about the experimental work we've done. And now I'll talk a little bit about some conclu conclusions and um, a few ideas for future work. So I presented the results from two experiments. First, we build a dynamic model for trust using a linear systems framework where the next value of trust depends on the previous value plus the alert from the AV, true alarms, false alarms, and misses. The output of the trust model is the observed driver behavior, focus on the search task, use of the automated system, and performance on the search task. Common filter was used with this model to estimate driver's trust over time. Second, we used a trust calibrator to influence driver's trust. If they overtrusted the AV, we gave them a warning. If they undertrusted the AV, we gave them some encouragement. This calibration through communication was effective in helping the driver's trust come into alignment with the capability of the AV. So there's a lot of really interesting avenues for future work. I think this was just a very you know, early experiment. We had a very limited set of trusting behaviors from the driver, and this could be expanded in so many directions. Several researchers have shown promising results with physiological signals, such as heart rate and skin conductance. We tried to use sensors that were unobtrusive in an AV because we didn't want to be um, overly um, intrusive. Now, our non-driving task was a search task, which requires the same visual processing as monitoring the road. I think it would be interesting to look at other tasks that require audio processing or other types of cognition and see how that would factor in as a non-driving related task. We also focused very specifically on a, an AV driving environment with one human and one AV. I think there's a lot of interesting things to think about with more types of environments and tasks where humans and automated systems are teaming up and collaborating. But we hope that these results can be used as a groundwork for human automation trust in more diverse environments. And finally, this work focuses really on how does the human trust the autonomy? In all of our experiments, the human has total control to turn off the autonomy at any time. I think there's interesting questions to consider about how and when the automation should trust the human. Are there circumstances that would require the autonomy to take over from the human? What safety considerations are important? So I'm sure there's lots of interesting questions that we could discuss further. Um, and so I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, funding was provided from the Automotive Research Center at the University of Michigan. Hebert uh, Azevedo Saw was the primary graduate student who worked on this in collaboration with uh, Suresh and Connor. And my co PIs, um, Lionel and Jesse, have also been great to work with in this uh, exciting area about uh, driver and AV interaction. So that is the end of my presentation. And I will be happy to take any questions or hear any comments that you might have.